We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, and just to make sure everybody, do you see, you should be able to see my face, which I apologize for that, but that's the way this thing works. But um, hopefully you can also see what's down below me, okay? So you should be able to see um, the, the table that I've got set out. And what I thought is when I'm doing vision therapy, so when I'm working with somebody and I'm doing vision therapy, a lot of times, uh, let's see here. Sorry, I got to do something here. There we go. Learning a new platform, I've got to get everything set. So when I'm doing vision therapy with somebody, a lot of times I try to plan out the therapy and recognize everything that we do in vision therapy. If we're doing it correctly, we are causing some sort of brain neuromuscular conflict. We're loading or unloading in such a way that they're having to make cognitive decisions. So in, in my, in my um, clinic, we had 53 minutes that we spent with those patients. So if you started out and maybe you started out with an ocular motor activity, then it did accommodation activity, a virgins activity, a loading activity, all these different things. By the time you got towards the end of therapy, they were getting a little bit visually and mentally fatigued, okay? So I like to kind of close out, especially I didn't like to close out with um, accommodation or virgences if that was something that they struggled with. I want them to be able to have more something that they would be able to relax, um, have a little bit of fun, kind of give them something that they could leave on, 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 on a fun note. So I would incorporate my visual processing activities towards the end of, of the therapy day. And as I show these, and um, I've been showing these for a number of years across the country, and some of you may have already seen it, this is kind of an intermission. We've been doing a lot of the basics of vision therapy. We've covered a little bit about um, the aspect of what it takes to get fusion, um, the ability to have motor alignment and sensory fusion. We've been covering red, green luster, some fizz dip, those different things. So we're just gonna today take a little bit of an um, intermission and I'm gonna show you some activities that really you can take these and tomorrow you can implement them. There's something that you can do right away. And I hope by the end of today that we'll kind of see that, remember it's not the, the activity, okay? So it's always the action, okay? So anytime I'm doing any activity, with somebody is not, I'm not a playground supervisor. I'm not a PE instructor. Um, I'm a vision therapist. So everything I do should have a purpose. Um, there should be a reason behind it. I should know what parts of the visual system that it's working. I should know what I'm wanting them to get out of it. And then what are the red flags that I'm looking for if they can't do it. And so these are kind of a, a basic activity. Um, there's still a lot that you can load into them and a lot that you can infer from how they respond to you, okay? So that being said, we're gonna move some of these and we're just gonna start with just a deck of cards. And I've tried to make it that everybody can speak, but if you're not wanting to speak at this time, if you would just hit the microphone button and that will mute you, and then that way you'll make sure that nothing is coming over your, your microphone to the rest of everybody else, okay? So this is just a deck of cards. It's just a plain deck of cards. And what this is, is an ocular motor activity, but it's also a visual processing activity. And the very first thing we're gonna do is this, I, I don't get to everything on the first day, but this is where they, it would begin. So the very first thing that I would have them to do is they're gonna flip over a card and they're gonna match them by the suit, okay? So as they're looking through, they have their diamonds, now they have their spades, and then they have, oh, here's another spade, so they have to recognize. But if you notice, every time that I was doing this, I was just using one hand, right? So I'll stop them and I'll say, hey, how many eyes do you have? And they'll go two, right? And I was like, that's right. So how many eyes do you want working all the time? And of course, they're going to respond too. I want both eyes working all the time. And so I'll explain to them that by using both hands, that is going to stimulate the brain to want to use 
both eyes more than just using one hand at a time. So I'm gonna have them switch hands. So here we have a diamond, then we have a heart, then we switch it over and here's another diamond. So we know sorting is something that we do with kids from the very time that they're little. But if we look at this, what, what's the purpose of the activity? Is it just the visual processing? So as I flip this over, I have discrimination. I'm trying to match, does that match? Does that match? Does that match? We have color, black, red. We have different things that we can talk about. We can talk about the shape. A lot of times, especially if you have um, a heart that maybe they have part of it upside down, you can see how that shape and this shape begin to match really well, but then it has a stem on it. So sometimes they'll wanna put it on the heart. But every activity that I'm doing right here, there's three things that I'm looking for, or maybe four. So first of all is their ocular motor scan rate, okay? So we're looking at um, span of recognition, how, how many times if they, flip this one over and they're holding it here, how many times do they look back to their piles, okay, to their separated piles, back to this? How many times does it take them to go through that recognition part that they recognize, I've seen this before. The second is identification. So once they recognize it, I look at it and I like, I know what that is, but now I have to identify it. That's a spade, okay? And so either I'll have them say it or maybe in loading it, I'll have them say the, the number or maybe the letter if it's a, it's a face card. And then that way I know there's ocular motor going on, how many, how much is going. Um, sometimes less is more. So getting them to slow down, not go so fast so that they have a better chance of recognition. Identification, I now know what it is and now processing, I put it into the right pile. And then they switch in their hand and now they recognize, they identify it's a diamond and they process, they put it into the pile. So if we kind of break it down, the first thing that we have to have is input, okay? So the, if we think about it, the, the human brain, okay, it's there, it's all, all you know inside a cave, right? That cave is our cranium. And the brain has no way to gather any information except through the senses, okay? So we know the major senses, sight, um, taste, smell, touch, you know, all these different things, hearing. Um, now we think about proprioception as kind of one of the senses that they're talking about a little bit more. But those, those senses are what tell the brain this is what you're having to work with. This is where you're at. This is what you're doing. This is what's around you. This is all these different things. So if we think about it, that, that part is input, okay? So we know vision trumps everything, okay? John Medina um, is one of the authors that I like, and he's very clear. He's a, a neuro um, doctor out of the Seattle area, and he's very clear that vision really trumps everything. There's many times you, you if you ever have gone to the freezer and reached in to grab ice, and the first time you touch it, it feels like it almost burns you, right? But if you look at it, then all of a sudden it now feels cold. So vision helps us to I identify what those different things are. So once we have that input, especially through the visual system, now that information is coming back, it's going through that optic chiasm, and it's now entering into those visual portions of the brain, and there's about five stages that everything kind of filters through there, and some goes to the ventricle, some goes to the dorsal. All that information that's now been inputted, now their brain has to do something with it. And um, I've read in some places that they call it put-put. Now, um, you can find other places that will call it different things, but I kind of like that input and then that put-put because there's many times in my life where information has come in and I feel like my brain is kind of like that little engine going put-put-put-put-put-put um, up the, trying to figure out what it's going to do with it. And then the last thing is throughput, okay? So as I'm doing this activity, I'm judging, and, and not in a bad sense, but I, I'm trying to get some quantitative um, look into how well, when they flip that over, does the input process begin? 
How fast are they looking from one thing to another? How quick are they in discrimination? How well do they identify what it is? And then that put put, now what are they able to do with throughput putting it into the right pile, okay? So I won't go through all of the different ones, but they should be able to get to the place where they're moving. They have their four piles out. And now when they flip, they identify, they flip and they process. And you should begin to see that as they begin, as soon as I identify, if they're having to go step by step by step, then we know that they don't have any mapping going on, okay? They haven't recognized, you know what, I put my clubs here, I put my diamonds here, there's my spades and there's my hearts. We want them to get to the place when they flip it, they identify, recognize, identify, and they already know that's the pile I'm going to because they've mentally mapped out of it, okay? So this is just basic sorting. Now to load it, next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna ask them to have a cognitive load. And so again, um, every time I'm wanting both hands involved. So they're gonna flip a card, this is black. They're gonna put black to the right. And what they're gonna do is anytime that you have black, we're gonna add. So we're gonna add the number three to that. So when they set it down, now they have ocular motor. I'm still looking at their scan. They still have recognition, they have identification, but now in the processing, they have to add the cognitive load, so they would say 10. Then switching hands, we have a, a red, so we're gonna put it over to the left and we're gonna minus two, so that would be four. So then they flip, we have, oh, this is a great one. Anybody wanna tell me what this is gonna be? It's gonna go into the red and we're gonna, what, minus two. Anyone? Negative one. There you go, congratulations, okay? So how many times I do this, I get kids that they stop and they go, um, I can't. You know, they're just stuck. Their, their, their put put has stopped. They have no throughput and they say, it's only one, I can't take two away from it. But if we can help them to see, okay, a number line, here's zero. We have positive numbers going this way, but there's also negative numbers going this way. So if we can make math more visible, okay, so that they can actually see that, maybe not like a timeline, but a number line, then they can see that there's jumps going in both directions. And so they're just gonna flip, and here's another red, they're gonna minus two, so they would say eight, they're gonna flip, and now any face card is a 10, so they're gonna add and they're gonna say 13. So again, this is a speed of processing, they're going back and forth, I'm judging to see how fast and how much their, their scan rate is going, okay? Then, still working with the deck of cards. This one is a little bit more um, involved, but what I found is very, very important. So I know this has been shown different places, different times in different ways. My dad was a math teacher. And one of the things that he taught us was that if you can help a child to understand the 10 pairs, okay? So when we think of, um, vision therapy or vision um, developmental issues, um, vision related learning issues. Many times the thing that is talked about is reading, right? We always talk about, well, they struggle with reading, they struggle with comprehension. But if we really think about it, another thing that they struggle a lot with is math, right? They under, don't line everything up right. It's, it's hard to know where to put the decimal point. When they're doing long division, it's hard to keep everything in the right column. Um, nowadays, with the, with the way that new math is set up on a, on, a, on a page, it's very visually distracting. And so if we can help them in, in the math part, that's, that's part of what we're working at. And understanding the 10 pairs, so 1 and 9, 2 and 8, 3 and 7, 6 and 4, and 5 and 5, the faster somebody can recognize what it takes to make the next 10, it makes it far easier for estimation, for getting you know, an idea of where, where this number is going or where, the, where this is going. So this is called cover tens. Is anybody familiar with this? So basically what you have to do is you start out and an ace is worth one, okay? So it is a one, so an ace would be a one. 
and then you have one through nine, and then you have 10, and then your face cards are all tens, okay? Now, when we do this activity, we start out, we only need 50 cards, okay? So the first thing we have to do is take out a number, any number one through nine. So anybody shout out a number one through nine as fast as you can. Seven. Eight. Seven. Okay, I heard a seven and I heard an eight. So we'll take a seven and an eight and we'll take them and put them to the side, okay? So now I am the one that actually is gonna control the deck for them the first time. I'm gonna take that load out of it. But as I flip cards, okay, so this is one, okay? And I flip cards, they have to tell me anytime an automatic 10 comes up, like 10, jack, queen, or king, okay? or when any two cards, so not three cards or four cards, but any two cards together equal 10, okay? So we have two cards out there, they don't equal 10, that only equals five. I can't do all three of them, so even though all three of them equal 10, that doesn't count. I flip another one. Now, automatic 10, so they would shout out 10, and so I'm gonna cover it. Now, right there you can see, there's two that make 10. So instead of them shouting 10 this time, I want them to have the cognitive load and I also wanna know about their ocular motor and I'm watching their eyes while I do this. How fast are they scanning? What's their recognition, identification? How well are they processing this? And so they would have to call out six and four. So I'd take six and four. Now we have an automatic, they could just say 10 and then we'd go on, nothing there equals 10. Automatic, 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 okay? So then you guys could shout it out or I'll just keep going. There's seven and three. There's a 10, nothing. Oh, we have five and five. We have a 10, we have a 10, we have eight and two. We have nine and one. We have an automatic 10. We have an eight and a two. We have an automatic 10. We have a nine and a one or this one and this one. Okay, we have an automatic. Now we have seven and three, automatic. We have six and four, automatic. Okay, seven and three. I'll take this one here. That pile is getting pretty big. We have a nine and one. Okay, nine and one. We have automatic, automatic, automatic. Okay, now we have six and four. Okay. Now, I only have one card left, right? So even though I have six and four, I can't cover the entire 10 because I only have one card. So we're gonna set that there. But now we make tens out of here. So I have six and four, okay? I have five and five. I have eight and two. So those automatically make tens. So now I'm left with a two and a three. What would I need to make this a 10? The two. Eight. eight. There we go. Don't be shy, guys. That's why we went to this new program so that hopefully we can have participation and discussion. Okay. What do I need to make the three a ten? Seven. A seven, right? And so then you, this is where you get to be dramatic and you can snap, you know, and you can look over here and all of a sudden you get to put the eight on the two mm -hmm. and the seven on the three. Okay. And so really you're just sharing them with them. It's not magic, it's just math, right? It's just how it sets up. But a lot of times they'll go, whoa, how'd that happen? And so then you can do it again. So again, it's a great ocular motor. Um, you have scanning, you have recognition, identification, you have processing, they're involved. And the great thing about this is at the end of the day, um, it's one of the last things I do. When their parents come back, I, I, I've shown the child how to do it and the key is when they take out the first two cards because you only need 50 cards you have to take two cards one through nine that together don't equal 10. if i take a five and a five and put it out there then everything's going to match because that's my other matched set right so as long as they take one through nine okay and they don't match then the ones that are left, those are what they're gonna match to. So then I can send it home as a home activity that's an ocular motor activity. It's got cognitive load, it's got different things in it. And then they get to show their parents, they get to show their siblings and they kind of get to do the magic trick at home.
All right, so that's just basically um, just using a deck of cards. You can also get um, red-green cancellation cards and you can use it um, with red-green glasses. They also have ones that are MFBF that only work with one eye. You can use it for an MFBF activity. So different ways that you, you, can, you can add that. So that okay. is called cover tins. Oh, cover tins. Cover tins, all right? All right, next card game, and we're gonna have to hurry. All right, so this is called Blink, okay? So ha if you're not familiar with this game, this is my all-time favorite, okay? I, I use this a lot, and I'll, and I'll show you why, okay? Um, I started my little girl on this game probably when she was about a year and a half, maybe two. Um, it's great, great discrimination, recognition, identification, just a great game. So just like I started out with, with the regular cards, the very first thing they're going to do is they're just going to sort by color, okay? So there's yellow, and then they're going to flip. There's green. Again, we're going to go back and forth, making sure that they don't just use one hand all the time. And then there's gray, and there's blue, and there's gray, and then there's gray. And so now you can see, again, it's just a sorting activity. They're just making it into the piles according to color, okay? So second is now I've done color. So now I'm gonna do number, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do, there's a two, there's a four, there's a four, there's a one, there's a five, one, one. So as they go, they're looking, recognizing, identifying, and then processing. Okay, putting it in. So now they're sorting all according to, to, to number, okay? So they know exactly where. I'm also looking for some kids, they will put it into a line, right? They'll have their one, two, three, and four. I've been some places where they'll kind of put it however it comes up, the very first one, and then they'll put it in order. Two ways to look at this. Really, there's no right or wrong. They can put it into however they want. There should still be some mapping that's going on. But it's always fascinating to me that the kids that seem to get it just a little bit more, that they seem to clue in to what they want, they will start to make sure that they put it into numerical order. And so that's just one of the brain's adaptations to make it a little bit easier, okay? So just trying to make sure that they put it into. So that would be doing it by numbers. And then the last way that I have them do it is by shape. Now, I don't tell them what the shape is, okay? And the reason is, is I want to hear from them. I want to see what they say it is. So they'll say stars, and then they'll say stars, and then they'll say, you know, some will say crescent, some will say moon, some will say crescent moon, some I've had them say half circles, Okay, so it gives me a little bit of insight into how they think, how they process, what, the, what they want to term each thing. Especially, there's another moon, lots of moons. Here we go, that one. So, who would like to say what they think that is? What do you perceive that as? Clouds. Clouds, okay. Anyone else? Flowers. Flowers. Okay. Caroline, she also said flowers too. That's right. So um, sometimes they'll say clouds. Sometimes they'll say flowers. I've had them say splots, right? Which I'm not really sure if a splot is a little bit different than a splat or whatever, you know, but it's just how do they perceive it? And then we'll, we'll kind of talk about it, um, what they want to call it. Okay. And then they'll go on. Um, let me see. Oh, this is another one that comes up. Okay. So I call it lightning. Some people call it bolts. Um, I had one kid, he called it thunder, right? Because they kind of come together. And so anyway, it's just trying to identify what, what's their verbal of their visual, okay? What do they translate what they see into what it is, okay? So now we've sorted by color, we've sorted by number, and now we've sorted by shape. And I, I do that kind of because that's kind of the developmental path with little kids is they kind of learn their, their colors first and then they kind of learn a little bit about numbers and then they learn 
to identify more shapes. I know that they can learn like basic shapes, circles, triangles, squares, um, maybe even before their numbers, but I try to keep it in a way that is going through them, okay? So now everybody can do this. Um, you can mute it and just do it on your own. But what I want you to do is now that we've already identified colors, we've already identified shapes, we've already identified numbers, the first thing I want you to do is um, just call out to yourself or mentally um, what color you see, okay? Okay, how'd you do? So as we're going through, I'm giving them and kind of think about what I'm doing. As I'm going across, what am I having them to do? Cicade, cicade, cicade. And I'm actually doing it as I do it. I'm kind of going into that reading pattern. If they're across from me, maybe I'll start from this side so that I'm giving them that reading pattern as they go across. But then I'll start to go top and bottom, side to side. I'll go obliques, okay? So now what am I causing them to do? Eye jumps, okay? I'm actually giving maybe some eye stretches that are going on. But what else am I giving here, okay? They have discrimination, they're trying to do color, but I'm creating another visual perceptual problem for them. Anybody can identify what this is? Visual figure ground. There you go, exactly. You know, and then sometimes, you know, um, maybe let's use this one. Sometimes it's like this, sometimes it's like that, okay? So form constancy, um, can they identify? Crowding, levels, depth, very good. Um, then I'll hold it up, okay? And so right now this, this camera is not gonna work, so I'm gonna hold it over here. So then I'll hold it like this and maybe I'll have them follow it and then at times I'll just flash it, okay? Now over the computer, that's gonna be really hard, but they identify the color and then I drop it. And then maybe I'll come up this way and, and drop it. And maybe I'll take them and have them hold their head still and I'll bring it to one side and let their eyes come over here or they bring it over to this side and then flash it over on this side. So I can actually begin to use this, doing eye stretches, doing saccades, moving back and forth. I can set this down and now I can have two of them, okay? And so now it's almost like I'm doing maples, doubles, pursuits, and then I flash one. And can they perceive which one flipped? Can they tell me what color it is? I can hold one closer and one farther and flip one and then flip the other. And now I'm adding that distance variable, okay? So many different ways that I can use these cards. And if you really think about it, I do Maple's Double Pursuits a lot. My wolf wands, if I have a wolf wand, a set of wolf wands and Brock string, I feel like I could do vision therapy anywhere. But let's face it, if I'm seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years of age, or even if I'm my age, which is old, um, what's more fun, following these and guessing, okay, or following two little metal balls, right, around? So again, it's not the act activity, okay? It's the action. So if I can use visual cards that are a little bit more stimulating and more um, involved or what they would want to be involved in, but do the same action of getting eye stretches, of getting saccades, of getting near far work, all those different things, then that's kind of what I want to do. So after I've done color, Then I'll mix them all back up. And then now we would do, let's say number, okay? And so now they're calling out the number. So you can look at it and you can call out the number. Again, I'm making that figure ground. Maybe I'm doing the straight across or maybe I'm making them jump. I'd like to do obliques. I like to do the north and the south, the east, the west. All these different things, getting them to have that scan rate of going right to where they want to go, when they want to get there, and then how quickly can they pace and identify. After we've done um, number, then we'd go shape, okay? So in your mind or out loud to yourself, just, just call out. So as they're going, lightning, star, lightning, star, lightning, triangle, lightning, lightning. So as they go through. And it's really interesting that as they progress, 
how they get faster and faster and faster and faster, and then we can control it, okay? So that is the beginning stages of this. This is just getting them to be able to have good recognition, good identification. Then the actual game of Blink, okay, which is an actual game, they have to take the cards and I start out where they are only competing against themselves, okay? So I like to kind of schedule things um, from the easiest to get harder and harder. And so before I ever put them in a place where they're having to compete against me or sometimes other patients and stuff, we'll put them together and they can compete against each other is to get comfortable with it themselves, okay? So you just take two cards and set them at the top and then you have three play piles. Now your goal is to get rid of these and these. And so as these play piles are played out, then I can start, start playing out of here, or as I'm flipping over, I can play out of here. So again, we've already taught them color, we've taught them number, and we've taught them shape, and that's what they're gonna use to identify what they can play. So if I'm looking at these here, do I have anything in my play pile that matches either by color, number, or shape? So they can look down and they can see that, yeah, this matches by shape, right? But if I play that, then I lose the opportunity to play the one that's by color. So this one is by number. So if I match by number, then I can play by color, and then I can play that one by color, and now I can get three more out, okay? And so now I can go through, and now I have a decision to make. Do I play by shape or color, or do I play by number, and then I can play by number and number and get rid of all of them? Then as they go, now I flip that one over. I don't really need to put it there because I know that it could go right into that area. And I know that one could go there. Now that one I can't play, but that one I can. And now I can play that one. Now this one can play because it's a three. So you can see how it just kind of builds and they can get faster and faster and faster on it. So now I have color, I have number. And then as I go, I can get all three of them out. Now, if I look at this, I know this one matches this one, this one matches that one, so I can actually stack and play and then play. And again, I allow them to use both hands as fast as they can. They want to try to get rid of those number, uh, rid of those. So if you're looking on that, either in the chat or just shout it out, what do you see here that could match? The five balloons. Okay. Oh, balloons. There you go. I have a lot of people that say raindrops or drops. So I like balloons. That's great. So that can match. And so now we have color, right? Now this one doesn't match. So then they would have been allowed two more. Now we know that there's a match there, but if there wasn't, then I let them pull one more. And so usually that fourth one is going to give something of a match and kind of get them going. I just kind of get them going again. And so now they can play and they can play and they can play. And so the whole goal is to get rid of that. So for, you know, the first time that they do it, or maybe the first couple times that they do it, sometimes this is a real struggle for them because a lot of times they'll get locked into one where they can only see colors, okay? Or they can only see numbers, or they only see shapes. And we want them to get the flexibility, okay? The cognitive flexibility that their visual system is giving them the input, their brain is processing that input, but now they have the cognitive um, bandwidth, okay? That they can go ahead and process multiple different ways of matching things. So I kind of explain it to them that their brain is like a human computer and how many windows can you have on a computer operating at one time before the random access memory slows down and they can't do, they can't, they don't have anything more to process. So if we can get the visual part, you know, the ocular motor part, the accommodative part, the convergence part to really be such on a, a subcortal level that it's really subconsciously done, that's going to leave them a lot more processing to be able to make the quick decisions based on, on, on what they're seeing. So then um, after they've done it themselves, then I will split the stack. They have a pile. I have a pile. We have our, our ones that were going out from there. We have our play pile, okay? And so now simultaneously, okay, 
I'm going to be playing from my stack and my pile at the same time that they're playing on for theirs to their to these. Okay, so we're competing against each other. Now, this is just my philosophy. I'm not saying that you have to do it this way or that if you don't do it this way, you're wrong. But what I have found is I never let a child win. Okay. What I have found is when a child knows that I let them win, I lose credibility, okay? So what I do is I ask the patient, okay? I ask the child, what level do you want me to compete at? Do you want me to go slow, medium, or fast, or maybe level one, level two, level three, and let them ask. And if they say they want me to play at level one, then I pace myself, I just kind of time it. And so if I know that this is here, but I also know that they have access to be able to play it, I don't just snap it out there, okay? I'll count for a few seconds. If they get it, they get it. If they miss it, then I go ahead and play. And then I flip and then I go and I let them play. You know, I kind of judge the speed so that they have something to compete against but they're not competing against as fast as I can go. Now, I did have one girl that she, I mean, she was about 13 and she would look at me and she would say, don't you dare let me win. And she would say, I want you playing as fast as you can, as hard as you can all the time. And I think right before she left, she came within like one card of beating me and she was perfectly happy, okay? And so you gotta kind of judge, judge, you know, how your patient's gonna react. Um, I never try to crush a patient. I don't try to go so fast that they feel like they're, it's hopeless. I could never compete against that. I try to make it to where they're competing more against themselves to kind of push themselves to go faster. What is interesting is you can have somebody that seems like they're kind of struggling when they're playing against themselves, but as soon as they start playing against you, game on. I mean, they're just boom, 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 boom. So sometimes that inner comp competition begins to help them. Okay. Again, that name, that card game is called Blink. Um, if you have any questions about it, you can get it through Amazon or there are a lot of uh, targets, um, a lot of different places that you can, can get it, but it's one of my favorite. All right. Um, we only have time for one more. Is there any questions on the two that we've covered so far? Okay. So last one I'm going to show you because we're going to run out of time is just the game Spot It. This is probably the one that is the most um, blatantly a visual processing game. I started out, all I do is I flip these cards over and whoever came up with this, the algorithm they made is absolutely fantastic. So <laughs> Somehow, some way, they have made it that there's one picture on this one and one picture on this one and that they, they, they only won and it always has a match, okay? So I'll put it out there and some of you have already spotted it. You already know what it is. But let's say the patient is beginning to struggle, okay? I do not tell them what it is. But as they're looking, again, think about it. Ocular motor, they're scanning back and forth. You have a little bit of visual memory, okay? What did I see here versus what did I see here? We have recognition, identification, we have processing, we have figure ground, you know, we have form constancy, all these different things that are going on. So if they're struggling a little bit, sometimes I'll take it and just kind of move it a little bit. So now they line up. So it's a little bit easier for them to see. Then once they say fire and they get it, then we take it and we stack it to the side. And then I'll give them another one. Now, as they're going and they're getting faster, if I want to begin to add just a little bit of competition to them, I do not tell them what it is. I just say, spot it. So when I know what it is, I go, spot it, okay? So their job is to try to say dinosaur, okay, before I say, spot it. But once they get it, then they just get it over. Even if I say, spot it, they still have to identify it. They still have to pass it. They still have to get it. Then once this, which is really nice and close, they can get the apple, okay, really nice and close, then what I'll begin to do is spread them out, okay? So now this is a farther cicade, plus since they're not right here, it's, it, they can't really remember and see them together, they can't use periphery as well. Now I have a bigger jump, okay? So now they get the apple, 
next time I'll go up and down. Okay, so now I'm hitting up gaze, down gaze. Okay, so now is their processing different when they're in up gaze versus when down gaze? And so now as they're looking at it and they're trying to identify, okay, if they look up and look down, look up and look down, how many times do they do that before they recognize the bomb is it, okay? Now I can take and start putting them to the obliques, okay? I can put them this way, okay? Um, different ways that I put them, distances, staggered, all these different ways, I'm judging how well that they're judging where it is in their periphery, how quickly is their saccadic movement and how sure it is, are they just kind of bouncing all over around it, okay? The other thing that, oh, I'll get to that one in just a second, okay? Um, other things that I can do, I can flip that one here and then I can hold the other one up here, okay? So they have one on the table and they have one in front of me. So now they're looking up here and then down, looking up here and looking down until they can find which one matches, which I have to kind of look at it here. Everyone's all oh, candle, okay? And so now if they're finally, you know, they're up and down, then they look at it. Well, this, everything I try to think about is how is this going to help them in real life, okay? So at school, they have to look up at the whiteboard and then down at their paper. They have to recognize what the question is and match it to the question in their book or the answers, okay? And so this is a great way to give them something that's more in real life. After they're really good and I can also take it and again, maples, okay? So I'll bring it over to this camera. I can move them around. I can put one near, one far. I can switch it, I can change it. And so now I'm moving through space. They're having to keep up and try to identify what the target is. Next thing is I work on visual memory, okay? So I put one out there, they look at that, okay? They try to identify. And then I flip it over and which one is the same, okay? So if I'm looking at this one now and maybe they say, nope, I didn't get it. I flip this one back and then flip this one back over, okay? Until they can identify which one is the same, okay? So one thing that you're gonna be looking for, oh, I'm sorry, it's spots. But um, one thing that you're gonna be looking for is if they're looking here and you hear them go moon, hatchet, lock, um, um, drop, cactus, okay, bird, bullseye, splat. That is a verbal, okay? So that's an auditory. Really what they're saying is they don't trust their eyes. They have to hear what they see, okay? We want them to get to where they can picture it and maybe they picture green, um, one purple, one red, a blue, an orange, a black, you know, brown, okay? So maybe it's just colors, but you want them to get, if they can, to where they can actually see it within their eyes or in their mind's eye so that when they flip it over, they can kind of look and say, you know what? Green, that's the one that matches. I can see it, okay? So this is a very good one for visual memory, um, working on visual memory. And so I'll do that and then give them, and sometimes I'll put them even further apart and go through the same process, put them in different locations, okay? Put them in different um, orientation, but at the same time, they can only look at one at a time until they guess it, okay? Then if we wanna load and we start getting to where we wanna add competition, then they get one and I get one, or a lot of times we'll, we'll, we'll kind of combine. If we have two kids that are kind of the same age or at the same level, we'll kind of work them together. And then we just take, the, take it and set it upside down, okay? So now as they're looking, maybe they say they see the pencil. And then when I, I go and I, I see the bomb and we're going at the same time and maybe I got the bird and they're like, oh, I had the bird too. And then they're going back and forth and it just depends on who sees what first. Okay, so I see the hand and then um, they may see, let's see, bring that in. Anybody see one that matches that one? snowflake there you go okay and so then they they can take it and so then at the end then we just count who has 
who has what, okay? So that is the game Spot It. Um, all these games, okay? So Spot It, Blink, and these cards, and unfortunately we don't have time to, to get to brick by brick, but maybe we will at a different time. They're just simple. There's something that people could have at their home already, okay? But at the same time, I can do an ocular motor activity. I can do a visual processing activity. I can do an accommodative activity. I can do all these different things, um, different spaces, different locations, eye stretches, um, saccadics, pursuits, all these different things. So what I hope is that, yeah, they're games, they're fun. Um, they're a great way to end the session and send them off with something fun to do at home but they're still therapy, okay? They're not something that, okay, I did some therapy and now I'm tired and I don't wanna do any more therapy or they don't wanna do any more therapy. Now we just sit down and everything. Um, somebody mentioned that they could do flippers. Yeah, you could add an accommodative load. Um, one thing that you wanna be careful about that is make sure they're not a suppressor. So it's kind of hard to have a suppression check. So you want to be very careful that you're not doing a binocular accommodative activity unless you know that they're not going to suppress, but definitely you can add. So, and that's the beauty of this is you can take these little things and I know some of you will go and you'll make it even a better activity and you'll have more fun with it than, than what I've come up with. And you, hopefully you'll come back and, and show me and teach me. So I want to open it up. Is there any questions or um, anybody want to share anything before, before we depart? You can either type your questions in or just feel free to unmute yourself and, and come on. James, for the game Spot It, can you also purchase that on Amazon, you said? Yes, Amazon is a good one. Um, they also, I've seen them at Walmart, Target, Shopco, um, some of those, those places. Now, there are lots of different types of Spot It, okay? There's the generic Spot It. There's also um, Spot It Camping, Spot It Sports, um, Spot It, um, I think it's like, oh, like, like it has the McDonald's symbol, the Chick-fil-A symbol, it's all signs, okay? So there's a wide, there's a, an easy one that is like the ABCs and shapes um, for kids. Um, this is another one. If you have three-year-olds and four-year-olds, get them doing spot it, okay? Great preparation for, for knowing how to, how to uh, recognize and identify. And yeah, Amazon does have it too. Anyone else? All right, well, I wanna say thank you. I appreciate each one that um, has come on. Uh, we did record it, and so hopefully um, we'll figure out with this new, new platform how to get that shared out and so that people will have the links to it. And um, next month, we will be back into our, our discussion on fusion. And um, we hope to see you then. All right. Thank you so much.